Goodness. Trevor might need to turn me up. I'm probably not as loud as Pastor, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that to him. I am not Pastor, you may have noticed. Um, trying to get this thing on, I realized we have completely different shaped heads. Um, so hopefully it'll stay on. Um, goodness, it's good to be here. Um, I, I have all my notes. It's been a rough couple weeks. Has uh, anybody had a, for a rough week or two in a row? <laughs> um, so, when Jesus was baptized, he immediately went out into the wilderness and was tempted by the devil. And... I think that sets a good example. Jesus says, if this world persecuted me, it'll persecute you who follow me. And whenever you commit to doing something to honor the Lord, um, you can kind of plan on the devil coming against you. Just like Jesus. And figure if Jesus is, sub is subjected to it, then why should I expect any different? I was actually picking up the phone this last week to try to find somebody to do this for me because I was not in the right mindset. Um, been a rough couple weeks. Um, so I just kind of sat down and started thinking about the Bible. What does the Bible say? And there are a lot of examples in the Bible about people who just aren't having a good time. Um, the one first comes to mind is Job. <laughs> you know, fellow had a rough go of it for a while. Um, but uh, I'm currently in my Bible reading plan in the book of Psalms. The one hit me in particular with David. Um, and it doesn't say, some of the Psalms say this was written by David during this time. Um, and this one doesn't say that, but he's talking about, um, you know, everybody turning on him and fleeing for his life. Um, and he says, even the one that was closest to him, that he shared his food with, turned his back on him and betrayed him. And I couldn't help but think, that you know David's own son Absalom read, led a revolt against David and actually drove him out of the city. David was on the run, and he had a good friend. Um, his best friend, I'm kind of jumping around. His best friend uh, was definitely Saul's son Jonathan. Um, when Saul was trying to kill David because, you know, Saul knew that the Lord had said David was going to replace him as king. And he was jealous and the recognition that David was getting. And so he tried to kill him several times. And Saul's son, Jonathan, and David were really close. And Jonathan protected David against that. And David and Jonathan made a pact that they would always look out for one another's family. And so once David was established as king, he asked, is there anyone of Jonathan's family that I can show blessings to? Um, and Jonathan had a son named Meshibetheth. Um <laughs> And he was crippled because... Back then, you know, if you wanted to take out a ruler, you took out their whole family so that there would be no rebellion later on. Well, they were killing all the family of Saul, and the nurse that was taking care of Meshibetheth, <laughs> when, he was, when he was a baby, dropped him and busted his legs. So his legs were crippled. But he was still around. And so David learned of him and brought him into his own home and shared his food and they became quite close. And when David was on the run, Meshibetheth 
you know, he looked for him and he wasn't around. And so David was thinking, because um, Meshibbeth's servant, I cannot say that name, um, told David that he had betrayed him. And so David is thinking that even his best friend, you know, his son read a, read a revolt against him. His best friend turned his back on him, betrayed him. And eventually, David got back into the city, um, regained his kingdom, and found out that Meshibetheth did not betray him. And, and it kind of brings the, the lesson home to me that a lot of times the picture we have of what's going on is not accurate. Or we might have an accurate picture of what's going on, but we don't have a complete picture of what's going on. And so, did Meshibbeth go with David? No. Um, so David assumed that he was betrayed. And he found out later on he was not. And so, it, you know, it just shows that we don't always have the complete picture. Um, and that led me to think of um, Ezekiel, pastor, shared this not too long ago, but uh, um, Ezekiel had the, you know, the spiritual high moment um, with the contest with the prophets of Baal, and the Lord flashed down lightning from the sky, and 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 the people rose up and killed all the prophets of Baal, and. You know, Ezekiel's got to be sitting there saying, yeah, you know, praise the Lord, glory to God. And, and then Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. And so he runs and finds himself hidden in a cave, um, hiding for his life, and he's depressed. And he's like, you know, he actually tells the Lord, Lord, it'd be better if I was dead because I'm all alone. I'm the only prophet left. Nobody's listening to me. And... That was what he saw. That was true. That was his truth. But it wasn't the truth. And so the Lord talked to him and showed him, um, you are not alone. And I have this many other prophets that are still loyal to me that have not been killed. And, <clears throat> and basically comforted him. And so basically his depression... And his feeling of isolation was unwarranted. And it shows that, again, we don't always have the full picture. But God does. Um, going back to Job. Job suffered. Uh, has any, anybody here read the book of Job? It's not an easy read. It's... Uh, it's speech after speech of, of Job's closest friends telling him what a horrible person he is. Um, and speech after speech of Job trying to defend himself and, and complaining to God um, for his situation he's in. And Job was in it. Boy, if you ever... If you ever feel like you know you you're suffering and you can't go on, read the book of Job, and you might realize you don't got it so bad. Um, but in the end, God responds to Job, and and He tells Job's friends that He's not happy with them because they have not spoken truthfully, like my servant Job has. He says. Um, and Job, although he had spoken accurately about God, um, he had not spoken completely about God. And God, in his responses to Job, basically puts Job in perspective. You know, this is you and this is me. You know, were you there when I set the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I put the stars in the sky? You know, and, and goes on and on about, you know, it's like 
when we get a perspective of who we are in relationship to who God is, it really, it really paints a good picture of who's really in control. And so God ended up restoring Job's health and, and blessing him for his faithfulness. Um, but there again, another instance where Job didn't have the complete picture. Um, what he had in front of him was pretty grim. Um, I think anybody that reads the book of Job would understand that. And what is in front of us in our daily lives can look pretty grim, but we don't have the complete picture. Um, while thinking about all this, I also thought of uh, um, Joseph. A lot of Old Testament stuff here. Um, but uh, Joseph, you know, persecuted by his brothers, sold into slavery, um, worked as a slave in Potiphar's house. Um, and then, you know, through a series of events was actually restored. But there was sufferings, there was beatings, there was, you know, wrong for wrongful persecution. Joe didn't, Joseph didn't deserve any of that. Um, Job didn't deserve any of that. But they were going through it. And why is that? You know, Job didn't deserve it. Joseph didn't deserve it. There's so many good people, good godly people that are suffering every day, um, either physically or emotionally, or their family suffers. And it's why is that? And well, the Bible tells us that we live in a broken world, that sin has corrupted the world. And J Jesus tells us that it's actually Satan that is in charge of this world, that this is Satan's world. And so all of the stuff that goes on is with the brokenness that's in the world today, the, the horrible things that happen and the stress and, and, and the, the bad things that happen to good people every day is a direct result of Satan's rule over a sinful world. But Jesus says, fear not, because he has overcome this world. He has overcome the sin in this world. And there's another world waiting on those who believe in him. And so in this world, we can expect hard times and persecution and things to not go smoothly pain, suffering. But it's not this world that our hope is in. Our hope is in the next world that Jesus is preparing. It says all those that belong to Jesus, He is actually building a home for each and every one of us in heaven. And if you've ever tried doing some home improvement DIY stuff, some people are probably better at it than others. And if you're like me, um, you're hoping that Jesus is better at it. Um, because if I was to prepare you all a home in heaven, it might be, you know, a two by four tied to a tree with some grass leaning against it. But uh, if that's all I get, I'm fine. At least I get to be in heaven. Um, <clears throat> but Jesus is preparing a home for us, um, for those who are faithful. The last couple of weeks, I said, were, were rough. Um, and the hard times aren't over for me or for anybody else. Um, they will continue until Jesus calls us home. And Paul, it's documented that he had a, what is referred to as a thorn in his side. Um, there's lots of uh, talk about what that might have been, but he prayed for for God to remove it, um, you know, basically to heal him. And in 
And he didn't. Um, God's response was that I am that God is glorified through our weakness. That that when that when we are able to accomplish something that other people see as great or godly or wonderful. Um, they can, you know, we and them can say you're a wonderful person. You have these, you know, wonderful talents, and you're so good and wonderful and stuff like that. And God doesn't get the credit. But if those of us who are broken and weak are able to accomplish something, then God is glorified because it's God working through our weakness that shows the glory of God. Um. The same thing happens um, with Joseph um, when you know he was weak, he was he was beaten, he was a slave, he was in prison, and God worked through that for His glory. Um, Jacob wrestled. You know, some theologians think he was wrestling with Jesus, and uh, and popped his hip out of socket. And, and he finally submitted to this person he was wrestling with. And once he submitted to him, uh, his name was changed. And it kind of reminds me of our, our 2 Corinthians 5.17 that those who become Christians, those who submit to Jesus Christ, are not the same anymore. A new life has begun. In that moment, Jacob disappeared and Israel was born. And the nation of Israel came from them. And so great things can happen in our weakness. Jacob's hip never healed. He hobbled around on a cane for the rest of his life. But in his weakness, in the prophets and in and the historians in the Bible always refer to Jacob and, and the cane that he used and how God supported him. And, and not only him physically, but the nation of Israel was like the, God was the cane that held up the nation of Israel, um, just like Jacob's cane held up him. Um, and... There's just lots of other examples in the Bible where God is glorified in people's weakness. And so being weak is not bad. Falling on hard times is not bad. Um, being persecuted is not bad. Uh, getting depressed is not bad. Um, it's what we do we're in those situations that makes all the difference. Um, we need to rely on God. Praise the Lord that He has given us the Bible. And if you read the Bible cover to cover, over and over and over again throughout your life, when you follow in those hard times, you can reflect on the words of God, on the promises of God. You know you're not alone that you're not the first person that has gone through hard times and struggles. And it's God and His glory that, that will bring us out of those hard times. So um, I pray that, that we would all just be able to look to God for, for comfort, for reassurance that He is in charge, um, that he can take the greatest or the worst conditions and turn them into the greatest glory. And we have a promise that for those who put their faith in Him, all things will work together for our good. And we might not see the end. We might not see the full picture. But we can rest assured that God knows what's going on. And He promises that He's got this and He's going to take care of us. And we need to believe that. And hopefully, 
prayerfully, um, we can get through our depression. We can lean on one another. We can share our stories. We can lift one another up. And, and, and a lot of times in the Bible, it's those around the people that are suffering that lift them up. Um, don't be Jacob's friends, or not Jacob's friends, Job's friends, where we give speeches on why we think uh, a person is suffering or going through hard times, or, well, if you would have done this, then you wouldn't be in this situation, or, or you obviously did this wrong, otherwise this wouldn't be happening. Let's not be those people. Let's be those people that say, with God, you can get out of this. With God, you can get through this. Let's, let's be prayerful. Let's be helpful. Let's be compassionate and, and try to set people on the right road to following Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the, the opportunity to get up here and share a brief um, message. Um, I thank you for everything that you have put in my life and in the lives of those um, around me. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will glorify yourself, um, bring glory to yourself in our weakness, that uh, you would bring healing to those that need healed. You would bring uh, comfort to those that need comforted. Lord, I just pray that you would show your sovereign power in the way you move through the lives of the people in this church. I pray that we would lean on you for all of our needs and look to your understanding and not our own. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if anybody um, would like to come and pray, um, if you've shared hard times in a recent history um, and would like to share that, I'd love to pray with you. But please, thank you.